Well, welcome. And in this video, we want to think about a new antiviral drug that's currently being developed by Pfizer. Now, one of the, I suppose you could say, good things of this pandemic is it stimulated an awful lot of interest in research. And we really do need antiviral drugs. And this one is a possibility. Now, I know there's other drugs around which may be repurposed as antiviral, but this one is a novel one that's being developed by Pfizer and could potentially be getting used by the end of the year. Now, if we have an antiviral drug that works against SARS coronavirus 2, then as soon as anyone gets any symptoms, they could take that drug. And that drug will prevent viral replication in that individual and they'll get better, which is good. But as importantly as that, if it prevents viral replication, that person will not be secreting a virus into their respiratory tract. So they won't be shedding the virus, we won't be having the droplet transmission and the aerosolized, aerosolized transmission of the virus. So it should prevent transmission as well and could be one of the weapons in our armory to certainly massively reduce the incidence of SARS coronavirus 2 combined with vaccination, of course. And hopefully, uh, to, at some point in the future, hopefully in the not too distant future, to eradicate the virus, which still remains my hope. So let's look at this. Now, this is called um, a novel oral antiviral for SARS coronavirus 2. Novel, so it's new. So this is not a repurposed drug. It's, it's novel. It's a new one. Now, the important thing about new drugs is that the pharmaceutical industry can basically put a copyright on them. I can't remember how long it's for now. I think it's about 15 years. And that means that only the developing company uh, can produce it or people they license to produce it. And of course, that means for the first period of time, they can sell it at a, at a premium. This is how they get their money back from the research and development. So the pharmaceutical industry is interested in developing new drugs uh, because it can it can make a profit from new drugs. Perhaps we could argue more so than it might be interested in doing clinical trials for repurposing already established drugs, which are now generic. And once drugs are generic after a particular period of time, they can no longer, be, well, they can be produced by anyone. Basically, they're out of copyright. So uh, the motivation to develop this drug is there. Now, uh, the, 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 this is progressing. It's in phase one trial at the moment, and the drug is what you call a protease inhibitor. Protease inhibitor. Now, um, if you want to understand this, we need to do a little bit of background science. So let's, it only takes a couple of minutes, so let's do it. So viral proteases are enzymes and they're endopeptidases. Right, so what this means is um, the, the virus carries genes to make these uh, protease enzymes. And these protease enzymes break down proteins. So they'll take a big long chain and they'll, 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 they'll break it down. They'll make it smaller. That's what an endopeptidase is. It breaks down the peptide chain from inside. So these viral proteases break down proteins as they build up new virus. Now you might say, well, surely if you were making a new virus, what you'd want to do is make more protein not to break protein down. But of course you want proteins of exactly the right size and these proteins must be chopped by these protease enzymes at exactly the right amino acid to make exactly the right protein to fit into the overall architecture of the virus. It's just as if you were, as if you were repairing a building. If you had a hole in the wall, you'd need a brick exactly the right size to go into that hole. So in the same way, these proteases produce proteins that are exactly the right fit, exactly the right shape to take part in the architecture of the virus. So it does make sense. And these viral proteases are encoded for by the genetic material, whether it's DNA or RNA, of the virus itself. So the virus is kind of bringing its own toolkit in. So really, it, to extend that analogy, if you like, the, the enzymes are the toolkit and the virus brings that with it. So it brings the tools to make its own proteins and the tools in biology are, are the enzymes. Um, and that's encoded in the deoxyribonucleic acid or the ribonucleic acid of the virus. And in this case, of course, SARS coronavirus 2, it's a ribonucleic acid virus. So it catalyzes, a catalyst is something that facilitates or accelerates the rate of a chemical reaction. And it's cleavage, so it breaks, it splits 
of the specific peptide bonds in the viral precursor proteins, giving you a protein which is just the right size. So if a protein is made that's like this, that's that length, but to fit in the gap you only need one that's that length, then the endopeptidase will split it and you'll get the exact right protein of the exact right size. It's kind of that simple really. So these proteolytic events are essential for the completion of the viral infective cycle. In other words, if you can inhibit, if you can inhibit the proteases, if you can inhibit this proteolytic, this protein breaking down activity by these proteases, if you can inhibit that with a protease inhibitor, the viruses can't reproduce. So it makes perfect sense. Protease inhibitors bind to a viral enzyme called a protease so that they, the protease inhibitors stop that from working. They, they bind to the protease, stop it from working, stop the virus replicating, it's dead, it can't reproduce. Now, protease inhibitors are used in other antiviral drugs. Now, we don't have many antiviral drugs. We have the acyclovir, like for herpes simplex, you know, that thing you get on the corner of your mouth. Well, there's genital forms of herpes, of course. Oh, you can, of course, you can get systemic uh, herpes simplex infections. Um, but they're also used in HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. They don't eradicate the virus there because there the viral uh, genome gets into the person's DNA. So it's hard to eradicate. Well, we don't know of any way to eradicate that. But it prevents the replication of the, the human immunodeficiency viruses. And it's also used in hepatitis C, which is another viral infection. So those these protease inhibitors, well known work in these infections absolutely no reason why they shouldn't work in SARS coronavirus 2 um, but of course that's what the clinical trials are for and they are being worked on with great uh, haste and urgency uh, as we speak because clearly the uh, the financial rewards would be huge and of course the benefit to humanity would be potentially huge as well if we could just get rid of this infection really easily so um at the moment, they're assessing the tolerability and safety of multiple ascending doses of PF that. So that 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 is the name of the drug, PF 07321. That, that's the code name for the drug. So that is the new drug there. That is it. Uh, that's all we know. We don't know what sort of chemical it is, although it probably is similar to the proteases which are already used in the treatments for um, hepatitis C and uh, HIV, we would assume it's similar to that. But we do know that this PF073213332 drug is very effective in vitro. So we know that if you uh, have a cell culture in the lab, you grow the SARS coronavirus 2 in this cell culture, this will prevent viral replication. So we know it works in the in vitro situation. This is, will it work in the in vivo situation, in the live situation? And I'm optimistic that it will because it's very similar to the drugs which you know are effective in uh, HIV and hepatitis B. And I'm also optimistic because it works in vitro, in the bench situation. And they don't say this in, in the very minimal press report that I've referenced here. But we would assume that they are only doing these studies because it has its antiviral effect in vitro at doses which could be replicated in the human body. So when you take the tablet itself, obviously that's going to be uh, dissolved in all the fluids of the body. So that's going to mean that where the virus is gets a relatively low amount of this drug, presumably that amount is known to be enough to prevent viral replication. So it does sound hopeful. And, and the idea of developing antivirals, to me, is really exciting because I've seen people suffer from so many viral infections that we haven't been able to treat just through lack of, well, the non-existence of antiviral drugs for most viral uh, infections. So phase one study is on healthy adult volunteers at the moment. So it is randomised. So they'll go into the experimental group or the control group by random allocation, which is the correct way to do it. It's double blind. That means the people getting the drug or the placebo don't know if they're getting the drug or the placebo. And it also means that the people, the doctors and nurses administering the drug don't know who's getting the placebo and who's getting the drug. This is not, these people don't have the infection already. This is testing the tolerability and the dose of the drug. This is, this is the idea with the stage one trial. 
It's sponsor open, so the people who are paying for the trial do know. And of course, they will crack the code at the end of the trial. It's placebo controlled, which is good, because when, when you give when you give someone a drug, um, you can get a placebo effect, which is the benefit you get from the drug because they believe it's going to help them. But if you give someone a new well, any drug, you give someone any drug, there can be a nocebo effect as well. So a nocebo effect means the effect that you get that makes people feel worse because they get the drug. So you need to give some people the placebo because some of them, uh, you need to give some of those basically a, a sugar pill or, or an inactive pill or a placebo because some of those will also suffer from the nocebo effect because they believe they've had a drug. And of course, what you're looking for is to make sure the nocebo effect is not higher in, in, in the, uh, in the experiment, experimental group actually getting the drug as opposed to the placebo group who are not getting the drug. So this is all good uh, research technique. Uh, now they're using single dose and multiple dose, and it's an escalation study, so they're going to give progressively larger doses to work out the safe dose to give to healthy human volunteers. Healthy adults are evaluating their safety, and they will be very well looked after while they do this. Tolerability and pharmacokinetics. Now, when you start learning about pharmacology, there's two, there's two big words to learn. The first one is pharmacodynamics, and the second one is pharmacokinetics. Now, pharmacodynamics is the way that the drug works. It's the effect of the drug on the body. So does it work on the nerves? Does it work on, in the lungs? Uh, does it work on the smooth muscle? It's how the drug works on the body. The, the mechanism of action of the drug, that's the, that's the pharmacodynamics. Now, the pharmacokinetics is the way that the body works on the drug because all drugs are going to be broken down and eliminated from the body. So um, if you drink too much one night, you might be sober the next day and have a hangover that day, then be better the day after because the, the drug and the breakdown products of the alcohol drug in this case are going to be broken down. That is the pharmacokinetics. So the pharmacokinetics will tell us things like the half-life, how long, how long does it take to eliminate half of the given dose of the drug. So all of these things need worked out in human volunteers because we're going to give these drugs to humans. So that all makes, all that makes uh, perfect sense. Protease inhibitors demonstrated potent in vitro in cell cultures on the bench in glass activity against SARS coronavirus 2 and other coronaviruses. So that is encouraging. This, this could end up as a generic anti-coronavirus drug, therapeutic, potentially. Could be prescribed orally at the first sign of infection, preventing the person getting sick, preventing the viral replication, therefore preventing the spread of the infection. So make no mistake, if this works, then in theory it should prevent ongoing transmission because it is preventing viral replication and if the viruses aren't there, they can't be transmitted. Pfizer's also investigating an intravenously administered protease inhibitor. Now, this is presumably a very similar drug. It's got a different code name. But the idea is that this, presumably a similar molecule, but given in an intravenous form, could be used in patients that were already sick with COVID-19. So if the patient missed the opportunity to get the drug at an early stage, they could still be treated later on and there's the possibility that this could be getting rolled out by November or December. Now this would be very ambitious, very ambitious, but uh, the motivation to do this is there at the moment. So very little on new antiviral drugs. Um, we hear even less on repurposing other drugs which we know have uh, antiviral uh, properties unfortunately. Um, but um, this is encouraging because I expect Pfizer to carry this through because the rewards would be so huge and it's looking like there's a good possibility it will be uh, efficacious, which would just be wonderful. Then we'd have a treatment option and we'd have a, a vaccination option. The Pfizer vaccine is quite expensive, of course. The AstraZeneca vaccine is, is way, way cheaper. Um, so this drug wouldn't be uh, cheap. Uh, we would presume, um, hopefully there would be deals for poorer countries, but who knows? And you're thinking ahead of yourself, those. But the, ahead of yourself there. But the, the point is, and this, this is the interesting point here. Um, these clinical trials that demonstrate drug efficacy, 
The drug companies organise these, but they've only an interest in doing so if they can recoup the cost, because it costs a fortune to organise these trials, of course. It's a very expensive process to bring a drug to market, and, and rightly, th th they would want that money back. They're, 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 they're commercial companies, so th that, that's understandable. That's the way business works. But other drugs which have antiviral properties that we've talked about before on this channel, um, because the pharmaceutical industry is not has not got a vested interest in investigating the antiviral efficacy of previously existing antiviral drugs. But these drugs still need to be trialled. What this really means is governments need to organise uh, trials for uh, already existing um, antiviral drugs. And it is really a bit of a mystery why this is not being done. I don't really see why this is not happening. Because um, if, if an existing drug that's out of copyright, that the pharmaceutical industry is no longer has particular claims on, it can be made generically by any manufacturer, then that, that could transform the pandemic situation pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, if we could eradicate new infections as soon as it comes out. So um, I don't know why uh, pre-existing antiviral drugs are not being uh, assessed in this way. But I am pleased to see that this protease inhibitor is. And uh, I think it's encouraging and it could well work. Time will tell. Uh, but it will be a remarkably useful weapon in our armoury. So um, if you bump into any politicians, um, do ask them those kind of questions and see what they say. OK, thank you for watching this video.